now with Stephen Dillon, who is the founder, CEO, director, head honcho, um, he probably prefers that final title, um, of Other Way Round Travel. Now, Stephen is, uh, and his brand, probably unfamiliar to most listeners, but I think this is one of the most interesting brands that I'm aware of in multi-day travel. Very exciting for a few different reasons. And we'll cover that for this in this show. Um, I met Stephen. Well, actually, no, I'll, I first became aware of Stephen when he wrote a guest post for the Tourism Tiger blog about how he got started selling multi-day travel and sharing some really generously, by the way, Stephen, sharing some tactics about how you got your, your multi-day um, business launched. So let's just start there. Uh, this is going to be an entrepreneurial journey sort of uh, episode. So what prompted you to start Other Way Around Travel? And what was your kind of special magic source for selling out your first trip without a brand? Uh, okay, nice introduction. Thank you. Uh, so I think I probably took a path that was similar to a lot of people that I kind of worked in the corporate world in London for, I think, 12 years. I got to a point in my early 30s where I kind of reached, you know, a fairly senior position, was making a good salary. Uh, I could see the kind of path in front of me. Uh, and just thought, oh my God, that's that's not where I want. That's not where you, I want my life to go. You know, you saw you you could see the top of the mountain in front of you and realized you weren't interested in climbing it. Yeah, I could see. I mean, I would look at basically my bosses or, or the you know the mm. direction I was going, and I, I just thought mm. that's not what I want out of life. Yeah. Um, so I didn't. I always say to people like I didn't go from there to starting a travel company the next day, right? There's kind of like a process you go through, like things like that don't happen overnight. Um, so I kind of, I think I went through a bit of a process. I was lucky enough to have savings. I took a bit of time off work. I traveled for a while. Uh, I've done a lot of thinking in that time about uh, what I would like to do. Uh, and I think over maybe like a six month period, I, I came up with this concept of starting a travel company and it kind of came from two angles really so i had spent a lot of time in colombia and south america and so kind of one angle was just hey this is such a beautiful country that it's actually really popular now but back five years ago it still wasn't that many people going there and so a part of it was like i really love to bring people and show them this country because it's nothing like how it's perceived uh, mm -hmm by the outside world. And then the other angle was being a 30 something myself. I had to think about that because I'm, I'm no longer in my thirties, but being a 30 something myself, uh, I could see this kind of trend that you have, uh, this new kind of demographic, right? You have, and I should say like our company, we specifically focus on a demographic between 25 and 45 the solo travelers, uh, which means most people tend to be in their thirties, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And there's this new demographic where there's a lot of people in the 30s that uh, they are not married or having kids, maybe the way that 10 years ago almost everyone was. Uh, and and there's, so this demographic who they're kind of, they're not living that more traditional life, but maybe a lot of their circle of friends are. So they're kind of looking for other people to do things with, travel being one of them. So. I guess I felt really passionate about that with that demographic and I, I felt really passionate about Colombia and showing people what a beautiful country it was. And I think uh, those two things kind of converged that to begin with, I ran trips uh, in Colombia for that demographic. And it's since expanded uh, to multiple other countries, uh, but that's where the kind of initial, the initial premise came from. Definitely want to follow up with you on that one about expanding to other countries because you've done some amazing stuff. You've you've built a low seven figure business, if I had to guess. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Low seven this figure year. business. This yeah. year, yeah. First time. Yeah, you're gonna hit seven figures yeah. first time. You you're on your own, as best as I can tell, right? It's like yeah. no employees, right? It's just you. You're no. doing sales. You're doing oh everything. Yeah. Everything. I mean, we have we have partners. 
and the VMCs. Uh, yeah, and the VMCs. VMCs. But apart from that, yeah, I am. Yeah. So you give me all the, the, the sexy titles at the start, but the reality, yeah. I am website developer, uh, yeah. social media marketer, You're right. service, uh, yeah. sales, invoicer, you know, all yeah, of those yeah. things. Yeah, you've managed to bootstrap a seven-figure tour business solo, uh, obviously with the help of partners, and we definitely want to talk about that in a second as well. Sure. But you had a unique method to launch your tour business that I think is going to inspire a lot of new entrepreneurs who maybe haven't read that blog post, right? Sure. Uh, Let's talk about that. How did you go about selling out that first trip? Because that's a question that comes up a lot in the Tourpreneur Facebook group. Yeah, it was really hard, right? Because I was trying to sell a trip that was, a, I can't remember the initial price. I think it was two and a half thousand pounds uh, five years ago. So I was trying to sell a trip that was about two and a half thousand pounds. People would have to spend another thousand on flights, so three and a half thousand pounds for a company they'd never heard of with a really bad website, uh, with no testimonials to a country that they were kind of quite uh, suspicious about going to. So right. <laughs> there was so kind of like... Just uh, going to jump in there on the currency conversion. It's about 3,200 US and about just over four Australian to save people Googling. Yeah, sure. back back to the... <laughs> to so the, what, yeah, what yeah. I guess what really hit on me is like there's so many companies out there with, with they are doing really good tours they have good websites they have a massive online footprint so the thing that really really hit on me is the only way to stand out is just to be really personal uh, mm -hmm. and that was to tell my story so really what i done was told my story told my story that i was this guy coming from the corporate world in london who decided to start this new company uh, and then i was just really transparent for that first trip i was just look you know, this is the first time we're going to do this. We're looking for people to come and try it out. We're going to give you it at cost. So we, we just, you know, exactly what they would pay to do that same trip themselves without any of the, the help or service from us. Just give them that, at that cost. And it just relied on a couple of people taking a gamble, to be honest. I think there was six people on that first trip. Um, and I always say to people, if they're ever asking, like, get to the first trip as soon as possible. Because the first trip is going to teach you how to sell the thing. It's going to teach you how to run a trip. It's going to get you photos. It's going to get you testimonials. So you can theorize for months and months and months or years and years on what your company should be. Mm -hmm. I would say to push all of that to the side and work out how do you get to do that first ever trip. Uh, and I hired a professional photographer on, on my first trip as well. Wow. So from there, everything became easier. Um, I'm sure we'll dig into this a bit. Like, how did I actually find those first six customers? Mm -hmm. It was through Facebook ads. Uh, so I ran some Facebook ads. Uh, again, I didn't know Facebook ads. I just, I know you know, you and I have discussed a lot of Facebook ads, but it's, I think it's fairly intuitive. I think it's a thing that you can go and have a play about with for a while. Uh, and run some run some ads to a website page that kind of summarizes uh, what you're offering and then it just kind of span out from there uh, right but I, I think the key for me was just being transparent not trying to be not trying to pretend i was like these big companies that were doing it for years because i think everyone would see through that to be honest mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um when i sometimes see solo entrepreneurs describing their business as we this and we that right? Because they're a bit concerned about being perceived as small. I see there's a very big mistake that solopreneur, travelpreneur, tourpreneur people make, right? You, um, you need, there's, a, there's a saying in marketing, which is lead, lead with your chin, right? So something that could be perceived as a weakness, lead with it as a strength. And it is a strength, right? So the reason, like, cor the reason corporates don't market personally is because they physically can't, but they yeah. would if they could, <laughs> because it's much more effective right well, so yeah. mm -hmm. the other thing is that when you're small and not part of a big corporation you can say things as well that you just can't say when you're part of a big company right you, yeah. you know the language and tone that you use in your marketing it can just be mm -hmm. done so different than, than what a big company can get away with doing and they'll have to go through lots of red tape to do it as well right yeah absolutely yeah but i want to poke at this a bit more because there's a couple of details here so uh in terms of learning facebook ads well firstly why how did you pick facebook right out of all the ways to promote 
your tour company? What was the, yeah. what was the spark? I guess it just it just seemed the logical place, like for thirty somethings. Uh, obviously, to be Instagram is a bit more popular, but I think five years ago, most people were still on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and it just seemed like a logical place to do it. It seemed like a, a, an easy way to like find people and inspire mm-hmm. people to come on a trip. Uh, and it just seemed, for me, it seemed easier to learn than, than Google Ads. Uh, yeah. But to, to be honest, it could have been one or the other. For so for whatever reason, I, I just went with Facebook Ads. How did you learn Facebook Ads? Uh, I, you know, I did. I Googled a lot. I read a lot of blogs. I probably signed up for like a really basic course somewhere. But as we both probably know, is you learn by doing, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Facebook ads, it's just always changing anyway. So whatever you learned six months ago is usually not relevant today. You just, the easiest way to learn Facebook ads is get your hands on and start doing it. And, and you just, you have to allocate a bit of a budget, right? Because it's all about trial and error. It's all about testing. It's all about what you think in your head logically is going to work often mm-hmm. doesn't work. It's right. just, so it's I just, just told like, me before on calls. <laughs> totally. Like, it's just, you're like, oh, this image is going to kill it or this copy is yeah. going to kill it. And it doesn't. And then mm-hmm. the one you weren't so excited about does really well. Uh, so I think Facebook ads is just trial and error. Find out what's working. And then just start homing in on that uh, mm. and you know, revising it a bit. But yeah, I think I more learned just by doing, just by getting on there. Yeah. And- so um, I'm going to put out a couple of lessons. You know, we we both of us have done very well out of Facebook ads, right? And I think yeah. I'll, I'll kick off. I'll share a couple of my lessons that I've learned, and be interesting to see how much you resonate them with them, and see if you can. Um, sure, sure. spark up a couple of, of your own so i think the, the first key lesson with facebook ads is to have something um is is to make understand that's the first step right so you were yeah. pointing people to a quite a detailed landing page and then if you want the full brochure or the full itinerary sign up via email from memory and we yeah, would do exactly. something a bit different exactly sending yeah. sending people they click on they click on the ad mm. they see the ad they click on the mm. ad goes to a landing page, the landing page, basically at that point, I think I was saying, if you want a brochure, you know, uh, click, give your email uh, and we'll send you the brochure and more information. Then putting them through an email sequence, like, you know, you know, a week or two of like emails Mm -hmm. telling them more about the trip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So Facebook ads is the first step and you must have a plan um, around that. Uh, Very few, very few people book off the first click. They need to kind of come consider you, Google you a bit, sit there, read the about page, all that sort of stuff. That's a big lesson. I think another lesson that's really critical with Facebook, and Facebook does talk about this, but it's hard to find them talking about this, is that a lot of people, when they try to do marketing, they, they kind of imitate marketing that they've seen or what they perceive to be marketing. Right. Yeah. Without, so they kind of use glossy, glossy style sort of destination photos, a sort of you'd see on like a billboard or a magazine promoting a destination. Sure. But when it comes to Facebook, though, you have to use images like, like I totally agree with you, by the way, very difficult to predict which image is going to win. But one thing I can predict now is sometimes which one's not going to win. And th- I know that like the glossy destination photo never wins. Right. Because it's, um, it's just it's just generic with every other company doing the same thing, right? It doesn't stand right. out at all. Yeah, like you think you're posting the most impressive image of a destination, but what's actually happening is that people are just scrolling really quickly down the social media feed, and their brain yeah. just labels it as generic, bef- and then keeps on scrolling before they're yeah. even aware. Like, there's no the conscious mind is not even aware this has happened. They just scroll. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So it's really really critical that like we found the images in generally the images that work are feel kind of organic they feel borderline amateur you stop and you're like oh what's this right like you, you how did, what is this image that's popped up on my feed that these random people taking a photo together on a trip right and the more glossy the image feels um the less it works it's quite amazing um and we every every time i do an ad rotation i deliberately put uh an image that I, I'm like, I'm gar- like, this, it's a shit image. Like this one, there's no way it will work. It's a, we have an image right now for a magnificent rail brand where it's the winner, and it's literally just like a, just 
just a random photo of a station in the countryside, but it's not particularly attractive or interesting yeah. image at all. Like there's nothing about that image that screams, oh, those people are having fun because there's no people in it. There's in like, cause you know, that a lot of people say you need to show people having fun. And I've often said that as well, but this is why I always have a, like a random image as that I'm like, this is guaranteed to lose because sometimes it does win. And yeah, you, another, you just don't know, do you? You don't know. Yeah, you can't predict it. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. Um, so that's the second one is it just, you have to understand that the very first thing to get a Facebook ad to work is to get people to stop scrolling and actually pause and to get them to, to, to actually pause. Yeah. You can't do um, generic marketing. All right. So those are two big tips I've got. Anything yeah. springing into your mind? I mean, the big thing I think about with Facebook, which surprised me and I think uh, surprises lots of people, you have to get so many people seeing your ad. I mean, to book, to book a trip, Really, like, I'm, if I'm thinking about my ads now, there's probably millions of people seeing those ads. That That is kind of the scale you want to get to. Like, getting, like, 100 people or 1,000 people seeing your ads is not going to get you many customers because mm. the amount of people that drop off between seeing the ad, clicking on it, going through your funnel, and actually signing up and committing to their time and their money to this trip is, is a tiny, tiny percentage. So you yeah. just need lots of eyeballs on it. Yeah. Um, and I would say the same as you, just like test different images. You don't know which images work, but definitely don't go with just the generic images. They just don't work. Um, mm. And that's, that's back to that whole thing. Like your instinct when you start is like, you need to show the world that you're this big, you know, professional company. And actually it's counterintuitive, but it's the opposite. So people are going on trips with me and with your uh, brands because they don't want to go with that big corporate company, right? Exactly. And so you need to you need to strike a balance between it has to look kind of legit and professional enough, but it still has to not look so glossy or perfect or professional because that's what people are looking for, something different. Mm -hmm. uh, and you write just often those images that you just took yourself with your, your iPhone without editing them, they just work. Uh, yeah. And you're right, it probably just stops people when they're scrolling, it piques their curiosity. And then, uh, like you say, that's that's the job of the Facebook ad is to stop them, right, and get them onto your site. And there's something else that you're doing which is interesting. It's that the first ad that most people see is not an ad for a trip. Right. So so with me, yeah, my I think the first ad that I do is more about the concept. Um, so I... And this is a belief for me that what I'm doing with my business is as much about community and connection and the group of people than it is about the travel. And I think a lot of my guests, I would say more than 50% of my guests were, were not particularly looking to go to a specific destination. They just like the idea of like going on a trip with other people like them of a similar age, traveling solo. They like that concept. Uh, and then they just got on the site and they thought, oh, this looks cool. I'll go here. But yeah, the, the, for me, I'm not like saying, hey, we're going to Morocco or on my initial ad. It's just like, hey, we're this group. We do this kind of thing. Click on here and you'll get more information. Yeah. If you, if you love kind of, if you love travel to the kinds of places that, that other people don't, but you just know in your heart of heart that you're just never going to convince your friends to do it, then click totally. here and. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've, we've, I don't know. I, mm -hmm. I, sorry, I don't know what it's like with your demographic, but for me, I really most of my uh, content will have it will be less about the destination. It'll be more images of the people who come on the trips mm -hmm. because I think for especially for my demographic, it's really important to them who they're traveling with, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, everyone has that fear. Oh my God, if I go on a group tour, am I going to be with fifteen? strange people that I don't get along with, right? So mm -hmm. so you really need to get the images on there that show people, oh, these people look just like me. Uh, yeah, absolutely. One yeah. of our most frequently asked questions for a long time was how old are the other people who are going to be right. on the trip? Yeah. And now um, on Patch Adventures, which is our oldest brand, that question has people stopped asking it because we've answered it by putting photos of the groups all over the place <laughs> in, the, the our, in our social yeah. media. Yeah. And they've, yeah. uh, but that's, that's definitely, that's, 
as big a concern as the destination to people, right? They just want to know that they're, they're traveling solo. They just want to know they're going to have fun with a good group of people. So I would say as quickly as possible, get a trip going, get a photographer. That's the best investment you will ever make for like a good photographer. And back to the, like we've talked about photos don't have to be polished, but I think of photographers, what I found is they're just really good at capturing the more like informal type photos you know if you have a photographer on the trip because again you know we all love a kind of group photo when we're all kind of smiling and posing but i think i've definitely tried to limit the number of those types of photos and just have more photos of people just doing stuff Uh, yeah yeah and you're you're right you're uh, yeah there's there's types of polish i guess right so the photos on your website are excellent because they feel they're they're well done but they feel real like you you want to be in that image right whereas I'm, I'm going to name a company here, Wendy Wu, right? Famous right. Australian Asian Asian focused tour company. Their photos are polished, but also stock photoish, very generic, right? Whereas yours right. are right. polished and professional, but they capture the energy of the moment. Yeah, and what's what's interesting? What this is one of the things I learned as well. That if you look at the bigger companies, um, everyone is like beautiful. Everyone has a six pack. Everyone looks amazing in their swimsuit, right? And that's not real. And people just want to see like real people just like them as well. So, so yeah, I, I think the, the photos are very important. And, and your biggest strength for anyone starting will be to find that line between it looking professional enough, but not just trying your hardest not to, to be like everyone else. It just doesn't work, right? Because they've, yeah. they've got much bigger marketing resources than you. They've got much bigger online presence. Your biggest, biggest strength will be to to be personal and be something slightly different i think yes however i want to ask you a question because we're dealing with this problem and we have significant areas of improvement that we can make you haven't run a trip to a certain country before it's the first time Uh what are you what are you doing about photos you mean, you mean to promote the to promote yeah, this? Yeah, because obviously you know, you you've got amazing photos of Colombia now because you've done the trip Mexico yeah. now because you've done the trip Croatia. Have you done the Croatia trip yet? We did, we done our first Croatia trip about a month ago. All right. So prior to one month ago, right? What were yeah. you doing for photos? So yeah, a mixture of stock photos, but I mean, I will really uh, search the earth of the internet to to get the best stock photos that I can find. And then you've kind of, at this stage, you've got to do what you can. So I would even put any photos from previous trips in like Mexico or Colombia that looked like they could be a bit like Croatia. And I would put them like group photos. That's what I suspected actually. That's what I thought you were doing. <laughs> I, think, I think you've got to do what you've got to do at this point. Like, you know, you've got to use every advantage you have. So I think we have some photos with a group in Cartagena, Colombia, which has the nice kind of city walls, which is not too, on a photo, it doesn't look too different from uh, Croatia. So for sure, right. for sure, um, I stuck some of those in there. But for example, I'm working on itineraries at the moment for like India uh, mm. and Vietnam, and I don't have anything that looks like any of those. So I am just using generic stock photos, but I'm hoping by this point that people can see from the other trips that we've done, the kind of look and feel and style of the trips. Uh, and, and when we're launching new countries, I'm very transparent that it's a new, a new country. But I think if you go on the website and the social media, there's enough there at this point that, that you can get an idea of what it's going to be like. Right. Cool. All right. This is a perfect tangent, a perfect segue. Yeah. What was it? Vietnam and India. That's what you said, right? I'm doing probably within the next month. So, at the moment, we do Colombia, Mexico, Peru, Brazil, Morocco, and Croatia. And oh. within the next month, we will be launching Greece, India, Vietnam, and Cambodia. Wow. Far out. Um, I guess all of this is because you, at that time when you went through a nuclear facility when you were a child and you grew two um, four arms and four legs and you just able to just do it all, right? I don't know how you do it, to be honest. Uh, so Mm -hmm. up until this year I kind of went on all of our trips Uh, so this year I've started letting go of that so I I haven't been going on our existing trips this year Uh, and probably the most immediate need I have is 
someone to do social media because that's actually really, really time consuming. Uh, social media, maybe email marketing, and just like some more admin focused stuff to respond to customers, take bookings, that those kind of things. Yeah. Cool. So you've got a lot of opinions about DMCs. Let's get into it. Uh, Right. <laughs> you've you've learned some lessons too. So, all right, let's talk about it. How does Stephen Dillon from Other Way and Travel, Other Way Around Travel, go about picking a DMC? And just as a sidebar, DMC is destination management company. I think yeah. that's what the M stands for. Right? I always get confused between marketing and management. Either way, DMC is a company that what that, that all they do is run tours on behalf of other brands. Yeah. So. They will pretend that they're part of Stephen's company for a few weeks, and then they'll to pretend they're part of someone else's company for a few weeks. Um, that's the way DMCs work. They actually do a lot of the execution on the ground in terms of sourcing and booking hotels, sourcing and booking drivers, all that sort of stuff. So you can just focus on the trip design and the marketing and all that sort of stuff. All right, sidebar over. Stephen and Dylan, how do you find DMCs? So it's probably an interesting background to say, like on maybe my first five trips, I didn't use DMCs. So I done everything. So I contracted the hotels, the transport, wow. the tour guides, the restaurants, all the experiences, airport transfers, everything. And I'm kind of glad I done it that way because now I understand how much goes into it. Uh, and then when we wanted to start doing multiple countries, it just became obvious that that is not feasible to do all of that yourself, right? Uh, across mm -hmm. all of those countries. And my hesitance of using a DMC to begin with was if we use a DMC, it's just going to become a generic tour like everyone else. And how do we have any different differentiation? And my my fear of like having this company that's just doing all these really touristy, generic things. Uh, so that was my fear over DMCs. I had to overcome that because, <laughs> because it wasn't sustainable to scale the business without doing it. Um, and pretty much everyone uses DMCs. Uh, probably most people outside of travel don't know that, but virtually everyone who's doing multi-day and multiple destination. Mm -hmm. are yeah, well, uh, yeah. When, when I'm explaining it to people, because sometimes when I explain it to people, like my friends or whatever, they're like, "Oh," it's almost like they're a bit disappointed, right? But I'm sure. just like, "Well, Apple." I'm like, "Apple, Apple's Apple doesn't manufacture their own stuff, right? They they design and market it." Um, and they have partners to manufacture it, right? And so this is just the way the the world works. You focus on what you're good at and find partners to help you do the rest. And yeah, especially if you have a business mm -hmm. model like ours where we're running, let's say I'm running five mm -hmm. trips to Peru this year. Mm -hmm. In the time between running those trips, you know, things are changing so quickly in these countries that the person you were working with three months ago is not doing that job anymore. So the partners on the ground, they just have their network of tour guys, of, of transport companies. It's, it's just, I, I don't see how you can do a business like this without using them, unless you're so huge, like uh, G Adventures or Intrepid Travel, that you just have your own kind of infrastructure on the ground, right? Right. But, but I, I would, I still believe that for the majority of the countries that Intrepid runs to, they they actually are using a DMC themselves. Okay. Um, cause mine, okay. So I'm just going to spit more numbers, but I believe that Intrepid runs tours to about 110 countries at the moment. Okay. And from, from my understanding, they have offices in like 42, 43 countries, which is a, <laughs> that's a shit ton of countries. Right. And some of those offices cover multiple countries. Right. So they have like a Southern Europe office and a Western Europe office and that covers you know, most of Europe. But you know, I know they, I do, well, I know for a fact that they use DMCs um, and G Adventures does as well. So everyone does it. Yeah. Um, so it's good. All right, we've gotten we've gotten over that hurdle. All okay, right. So, so what are some? How ways? do I find them? Uh, it's mm -hmm. a combination. It's a combination of uh, just really deep Google searches. Uh, mm -hmm. Speaking to you, you know, and you and I have shared a lot of DMCs between us. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and being in the, the tourpreneur group, that's a really good resource. Either asking the question or just searching through the comments as well. Right. Uh, are you um? So when you when you're googling, is there any special source, or is it literally just best DMC India? It's probably something along those lines, and I like I can go really deep down the Google rabbit yeah. hole. So I I Same. I will tend to find everything, you know. Mm -hmm. And the first time I done it was for Peru, and I the first time I tried to contract a DMC, I probably spoke to like fifteen DMCs, had my meetings wow. with them. 
And again, I'm, I'm happy I went through that process, but that process told me I don't need to do this again. Uh, because what I found is like, you waste a lot of time just in the conversations. And again, just get my, my way of doing it now is get as quickly as possible to the point, which is a quotation from them that says, here's your itinerary, this is how much it's going to cost. Uh, I tend to, I think there's two ways you can work with DMCs. You can kind of go into them open-ended and say, I want to do a trip to India. What would you recommend? Because you're the experts. I tend to do it kind of like, I like to have my own idea of what I want to do. And I like to go to a DMC and say, this is what I want to do. Happy for input, but I kind of want to give them at least a good straw man of what I want to do. Yeah, we are. We're, it's funny. That's a bit of a personality thing because, as you know, I'm in the other camp, right? We give them a bit of a detailed brand brief and examples, but we tend to let them just go off and do it um, and go from there. Uh, but I can't fault your style, obviously. It's working. Uh, yeah, we're just different personalities, right? Different, different personality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I just wouldn't be able to do that effectively. Um, as fun as it, it is to go on deep Google dives. Um, so, okay. So. If you had to go back into the past, talk to your younger self, right? Like you would say, okay, maybe you don't need to talk to 15 DMCs. Maybe the point is to get to a quote, right? What are some of the other big lessons you'd be sharing with your younger self to help younger Stephen Dillon save time? Yes. Yeah, so, so my my most important thing with DMCs, one is cost, obviously. Uh, it's a bit like buying a house or something. You know, you can see 10 houses that they're all the same price, but you get one that's really good and nine that are, are really shit. And DMCs can be a bit like that as well. You can get like a bunch of quotes for more or less the same thing and the price can vary wildly. Uh, so get get a bunch of quotes to compare prices. Uh, you will see from the quote if someone got it or not. You know, like you'll have a conversation with someone or you'll give them a spec and some of them will come back and they'll have a quote that really tells you that they've got your spec. They've put together an itinerary that... that that sounds like what you want to do is worded for you. And then you've got other ones where it's clearly a copy and paste job where they've clearly not listened to half of the things you've said. So you just discard those straight away. Exactly. Uh, Cause that's what you're going to be dealing with if you go with them. Uh, and then for me, the biggest thing is flexibility. So I think there's a bit of a compromise or, or a conflict on what we want and what DMCs want, right? My assumption is that DMCs want to do more or less the same tour for everyone so they can use the same suppliers, the same hotels. It's more efficient for them to run their operation. What we want is something a bit unique, right? We don't want to do the same thing as everyone else. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we need to compromise a bit. They need to compromise a bit as well. So I'm very specific about hotels. So most of the hotels that DMCs originally propose, I don't go with. Mm -hmm. uh, same with restaurants. Uh, and experience as well. So if I speak to the MC, I want to know that if I suggest a different supplier, though, though they're open to going with it, that I can do my own hotels, my own restaurants. If they're not, I just don't want to go with them. Uh, and the good, the good ones I find, that they are really flexible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's surprising actually how flexible they can be given how big some of these back offices must be. What, under what, by what criteria are you, rec are you rejecting a hotel? Uh, so I, I think a really good place to just look at hotels is booking.com because they have really amazing photos and they have good descriptions mm -hmm. and have good reviews. So, but for me, I want something that's petite. It doesn't, I do not want a hotel where you go there and it's just bust loads of tour companies. That's like the worst for me. That's the worst thing, right? You just go and then it's like buffet dinner and that kind of thing. <laughs> that's like my nightmare. So I'm just looking for something that's personal that probably most tour companies don't go to, that, mm -hmm. that feels small. I quite like to get somewhere small enough that we will be the majority in the hotel. So if we're taking a group of 15, if it's a place with like capacity for 20 or something, I really like that because then you just get amazing service and it feels super personal. Mm -hmm. um, something that doesn't feel corporate, corporate like, you know, like a Hilton or something like that. Uh, yeah, some, something that gives you a feel for the, the place you're in. You know, mm -hmm. being in Marrakesh, you want to stay in a Riyadh, you know, that makes mm -hmm. you feel like you're in Marrakesh and not just a generic hotel. Those are the kind of things I'm looking for.
Right. Yeah, I think the only time we make an exception to that is if they're coming off a few days that are a bit sort of rougher. Like they're, they're going through the, the the countryside in Kyrgyzstan, we're a bit nervous about the yurts or whatever. Then I might I might spring for something that just a, feels a bit safer to them, a bit familiar, yeah. right? For the simple reason that they there might be some decompressing to do. But um, other than that's the only exception. That's the only time I think we'd make an exception to that. We generally follow a very similar rule to you. And, that we want it to be interesting, totally, interesting totally. and culturally. And you need to compromise, right? Like there are some yeah. places where it's just like cities that don't have those type of hotels, right? So yeah, you exactly. will always need to make some exceptions. But that's my kind of uh, starting point, I would say. Mm. Okay. Um, what are some things that DMCs do that really piss you off? First of all, I think uh, I've been quite lucky to date with the DMC that we're working with because they're really good. Uh, I don't like the best DMCs. They're chasing me for information. Like they're saying, Steve, you know, this tour is starting in 60 days. You have to give us, you know, the passport information, customer numbers. I really don't like when I'm chasing them because <laughs> it's just that I feel like the di- dynamic is shifted then, right, if I'm chasing them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I like... Because we do like a series, we do in each country, we try to do at least five trips. I personally want the same tour leader on every trip. Uh, it's not always possible. Uh, and because DMCs, they're using freelance tour leaders as well. So for them, it's really quite hard. And they're juggling multiple clients and everyone everyone wants the best tour leader, right? It's, it's, you, 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 you come across a good tour, tour leader, you're like, I want him or her for all of my tours. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a constant battle when you find someone to be like, can I just get them on all of my five tours this year? Uh, and often they change them and they don't tell you till the last minute and stuff like that. Yeah, things like that. But yeah. generally, yeah. I think so far we've been pretty lucky that mm-hmm. the DMCs we're working with are really good. Yeah, likewise. Um, one, one. Um, so what we always do is, I'm sure you do the same thing, which we, we meet our guides and brief them on the brand and talk about this is how we're different and, we actually don't want you necessarily to follow the written itinerary. We've left, because what we always do is we have the actual itinerary and then we have what we publish and there's always a gap in terms of what's listed. And I say, all that stuff that's not on the website, you have complete discretion to drop or remove or change because no one knows it's coming, right? And all of our guides so far have gotten that, but we actually just had a trip once just now where the guide didn't get that. Okay. And should have dropped something. And we got a frustrated email from one of the guests saying, we're exhausted. The whole group like is grumpy, like blah, 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 blah. And, um, and that was the first time that message hadn't sunken in with the guide. Yeah. Right. And I was a bit, you know, you know, so there was a bit of a you know internal kind of like flurry of messages and just like, you need to have the confidence to change the itinerary. And the issue here is, I believe is that this particular guide has spent a lot of time guiding German tourists. Okay. Right. And of you know, leading straight into stereotypes. The stereotype is that German travel groups like to have every single detail written down for them and they like to follow the detail and they don't complain if it's a long day because they're getting everything that's given, that's written on. They like to give what's written in the package, right? Now, regardless of whether that's true or not, that's what definitely this guy, this guide believes <laughs> because he wasn't even interested in varying it until we had, we got the complaint. We're like, dude, you must vary the trip according to the needs and moods of the group and the circumstances on the ground. And then to his credit for the rest of this trip, he did. Okay, that's good. Uh, I So back to me being a bit more hands-on, up until this point, I have went on the first trip of each destination that we launched. So, you know, in Croatia, four weeks ago, I was on that trip. Uh, I found uh, a couple of big things I found is trying to change a, a tour guide who's been doing this for 20 years or 30 years, trying to change their style or personality is not really going to work. They might change it because you've annoyed them for like... Uh, a couple of days or they might change it because you're there but they're going to inevitably fall back my personal opinion fall back into their own personality and style uh, so i have had a couple of trips where i do the first trip with the tour guide and i've essentially kind of took over because i just didn't think they were uh, strong enough or uh, and, and by taking over i mean i've really taken the lead of like hosting the trip and just got in to do logistics uh, mm. that's been the minority of cases. The majority of cases, when I've went within like a half a day, I'm like, this tour guide knows what they're doing way more than I do. They've been doing this for years. They're brilliant. And then I've just sat back and let them do their thing. Uh, so again, probably been a bit lucky with that. But when you come across a good tour guide, 
they get it. They really get it. Mm. And they really they know do. what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's it it it's true. But I will say that we have had guides tell us that they have found it extremely liberating to lead trips for us. Right. After having gone through the specifications, because they're like, and this is and this is what's actually helped us in that problem that you just talked about with getting the same guide again and again. Yeah. Because we're just like, yeah, we want you to take control of the trip. We want you to show the places that are most popular. And like a lot of them have, um, they've been completely neutered by the companies they've been working for. Yeah. And they, the best ones love that freedom. They love that that ability. Um, you know, one of them took um, took the group to like his favorite ice cream shop in Summerkand and his family was there waiting for the group. Right, oh, that's nice. Where he's, because it's where his family goes to have an ice cream. And like that group, man, that was one of their best memories of the trip. And he's now in love with our company. And so we've got him on lock, right? Yeah. And for most of our guys, we've got them on lock, um, I think, because of that really proactive sharing of the philosophy. And we've, <laughs> we've actually had a few of them. I don't know if this has happened to you. You can tell me. But um, a few of them have, have, have by, they like come directly to us to ask if they can just stop working for the DMC and just work for us directly as a guide. Has yeah. that ever happened to you? Uh, it's really interesting because I've because I've been on the first tour. I'm almost like mm. on a friend basis with most of my guys. Uh, yeah. So there is always that kind of possibility of doing kind of always that thing between you were like we could do this at some point, mm. but just in the short term, I don't think it's worth it because you know yeah, they, they, they also don't want to. The ones I'm working with, they don't want to mess up their relationship with the DMC because they get other work from the DMC, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And yeah, I think it's more like a throwaway. Yeah, totally. And also from our point of view, uh, we probably don't. That's the the value of having a DMC is that they have a network of guides. So if that guide gets mm -hmm. sick, they have other guides, whereas we don't, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we um, yeah, we there's only one instance in which we've actually pursued that conversation, and the reason we were able to is because he, the DMC, texted me first. He's like, yeah, so. This particular guide has expressed interest in working with more with you guys directly. Um, uh, that's okay, it's fine because um, this is for a multi-country trip, right? Uh, and the, and so the guide's looking and he's like, the reason um, I matched the guy with you actually is because he's trying to set up his own business in his own country, and this is the final step that he's taking. And I thought you guys would be a good fit. So he was actually just wishing him the best, right? So that guide is in the process. He's he has those connections, right? He knows all the other guides. Yeah, he's largely yeah. been putting together. He's largely being. The DMC for that DMC for that particular country, right. if that makes sense. He's yeah. been an in, in country expert, and they're like, "Look, it's it's sad to see him, you know, want to find his own path, but obviously that's inevitable." And he has the entrepreneurial spirit, so we wish him all the best. So I guess that's a very unique circumstance. Yeah, uh, we're very lucky, very lucky. But um, I guess the yeah, the moral yeah. of the story is like when you get a good tour guide, that's just half the battle. You know, if you get someone yes, you trust, absolutely. someone you just know, you don't have to micromanage them or tell them the things like mm -hmm. you just get it. And, and the same, I think the tour mm -hmm. guides enjoy running our trips as well. It's for the yeah, because it's sure. not as much like regulation or like process compared to the bigger companies, right? And, and also, my guides are like the same age and demographic as my guests, so I think they just find that a lot more fun. Yeah, I'm sure they do. I'm sure they love um, leading um, trips for your for your groups. Um, so, during a trip, obviously, you've had to learn how to not be present physically. Uh -huh. uh, how do you How are you running it? Do you have a WhatsApp group? Yep. So. Basically, we will send two months before the trip. That, so the way we do it is we have a deposit when you book. Then two months before the trip, you will pay the full balance. Uh, at that point, we will send out a it's called a pre-trip information pack. Uh, and then about a week before, we'll send like another email with a more like kind of like hour by hour schedule of how things are going to go. Uh, by we, that, you mean you? Uh, me, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. uh, and that's really good for the kind of type A personalities who want to know that you know everything's planned and they don't it's not like they really like I don't think pay too much attention they just like to know that there's a schedule there mm. uh, and then probably most of our trips start on a Saturday so probably on like the Wednesday before the trip we'll start a WhatsApp group with the tour leader and all of the all of the guests and then that gives them a bit of a chance to interact before meeting um, mm -hmm. And then running it, I yeah, mostly I will run the WhatsApp group 
until people arrive. And then from that point, I'll just hand that over to the tour leader. Uh, and then the tour leader and I will have like a channel, a WhatsApp channel through the trip as well. Mm-hmm. But again, the, the tour leaders that I've got, they're very capable. So they're, they're only, and I get, I like kind of tell them, you know, if there's anything that needs fixed with like a couple of hundred dollars, just like do it. You don't need to like ask for permission. Just sure. do it. Uh, so yeah, mostly they're just giving me updates, sending photos, just telling me how things are going, but nothing major. Cool. So we're coming towards the end of our time limit. Um, one thing I want to really hone in on just as we sign off is, okay, so you're this calendar year, you're going to do it somewhere in the low seven figures, right? Uh, in pounds, I expect that we'll do like a million pounds. Yeah. Cool. And, yeah, for sure. Um, if not more. And you've, uh, you're running things out of spreadsheets, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and I'm emphasizing this because I personally have a tendency, tendency to overcomplicate. Okay. Right? I know a lot of people have a tendency to overcomplicate, right? Sure. Uh, using which which email provider are you using? Mailchimp? Uh, Mailchimp, yeah. Yeah, Mailchimp, right? Mailchimp, spreadsheets, how are you taking payments? How are you taking bookings? Uh, we are using a third party invoicing software called FreshBooks, which is a bit like Quick. Yeah. Right, right. So you're not using any book, online booking platform, there's no availability. No on yeah. your website you're manually updating everything yeah yeah you're writing every aspect of the itineraries yourselves yourself yeah yeah you're responding to all emails yourself yeah i mean things like things like the reason i'm laughing is it just gives you the heebie-jeebies to even think you had. <laughs> things like the itineraries i use freelancers for that kind of thing uh, so i'm using oh, for, for writing okay uh, for okay. Various okay things okay. Uh, but most of okay. it i'm doing myself and i guess the point you're making is all very low tech uh, yes yeah, and it's all very simple. And I think that's enough to get you to a certain point. And now I'm at the point where I'm picking my head up and like, okay, mm. for this to get bigger, we need mm. to like bring in some software and bring in some people. But for me personally, this feels like exactly the right time to do it. A year ago, did not it felt too early to do that. Mm-hmm. And for yeah, and I, I applaud you because the quality of your product for one of a better term is going to be a lot higher as a result because you've been across every part of the business you know how to do every aspect of the job you understand the key fundamental under, under underlying principles of how it works and you also understand just keep it simple stupid right yeah and i think i think it, it all comes down to personality type as well for me mm-hmm. i think in the long run it would be much better for me that i have done everything uh, mm-hmm. when i build a team i understand what it takes to do marketing to do sales to to run trips like to do the task of a DMC, it really helps me personally. That's that's definitely my personality. I like to understand the things that I manage. Uh, so yes, I think in the long run, it's going to be super helpful. Yeah, I think it's a it's a drawback for our company that I've never done contracting with hotels and all that sort of stuff. And we're going to be working on in the next year. We want to we want to learn the process a bit ourselves, right? So, and it's an awkward timing for us to do it because it's quite busy as a business, but we've realized that we just need to develop at least not do it all, but like have get de- develop some experience in this sort of stuff. So we can know what it's like for our DMCs, like when, how much we can trust some of the answers that are coming back to us and that sort of stuff. Right. Sure. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a, that's definitely a lesson learned. Um, cool. So it's the website is other way around dot travel. Is that right? Uh, yep. Other way around dot travel travel uh, it doesn't have the it's not around everyone thinks there's an a in front of around uh, it's like other way around as in let's go the other way around right yeah right do you own the other one will, other way around as well are you redirecting it or uh, no I, I think probably i did at the start you probably you probably do that yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. redirect it It'll, you, well you get 10 extra clicks a year yeah not many. um Anyway, uh, yeah, so people will watch Stephen, Steve at otherwayaround.travel if they want to get in touch. Yes, yeah, Steve at otherwayaround.travel, yeah. Steve, all right. Well, thank you very much. I look forward to having you back in a couple of years to talk about your progress.